Tonight, we want to talk about something that's really exciting, that I'm really excited about, a, a once-in-a-lifetime event that's coming up in just about a month's time, which is a total solar eclipse. Where were you? Oregon. Yeah, so Oregon had one in 2017. Yeah, so, but that was in Oregon. But here in Toronto, we haven't had one. The last time we had one was 1925. So assuming that you live in Toronto your whole life, it's a once in a lifetime event. The next one's gonna be another 120 years from now. But, it, but there is a difference between Oregon, the last eclipse and the current eclipse, which I wanna discuss as well. So we're gonna have an eclipse on April 8th, 2024 just in about five, six weeks. And it's gonna reach totality here in Toronto at 320. We're gonna get like 99% full. The moon is blocking the sun in the middle of the day. It's gonna be pretty spectacular. If you're, Niagara Falls is gonna get an even better view. So Hamilton, Niagara Falls. And uh, it's actually, it's gonna, the, the path that it passes this time around is pretty amazing because it's gonna cover like all the major Jewish communities. It's going to hit like Montreal, Toronto, New York will get a mostly covered, not total, but mostly total. It's Chicago, like I, even Los Angeles will get 70 something percent coverage. Even Miami, the sun in Miami will be more than half full. Mexico City. So unlike the 2017 eclipse, which kind of missed all the major Jewish communities, uh, the big ones, this one's actually hitting all the big Jewish communities in North America. So. I think most of the Jewish community didn't get to see a total eclipse last time. I remember the 2017 eclipse. I saw like a sliver of it because uh, here in Toronto it was very partial. But this one is going to be a proper total solar eclipse. And it's going to be even more significant because it's going to be number one, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, which is also special because we know Nisan is the month of, you know, the month of redemption, a very special month on the Jewish calendar, the first month of the Jewish calendar. And also just a few days before, there's going to be a really cool planetary alignment where you're going to have Venus, Neptune, Saturn, and Mars all aligned in Pisces, in the Pisces constellation, which is also significant because we know that Pisces is Adar, Misha Nichnas Adar, Marbin Besimcha. It's like a, it's considered a positive sign, a good sign, Pisces. And so you're going to have the four planets also aligned in Pisces, which has a lot of very interesting astrological significance. Of course, we have to reiterate that in Judaism, you're not allowed to use astrology for like fortune telling or for predicting the future, but astrology is a thing and it does have, the stars do have some kind of meaning and influence as it says in the Torah that God created the stars, la mo'adim, le'itim, as signs to give us clues to things that'll happen in the world. So that's, that's where, astral, where we draw the line with astrology. We're not trying to kind of predict are, you know, it's not like reading your horoscope, but the, the constellations do have some spiritual significance. So we want to talk a little bit about that today. An eclipse in Israel? So what's, they're not, this one they're not going to see in Israel. Actually, I looked up how often do eclipses happen in Israel, and it's, the position of Israel is such that it's extremely rare for a solar eclipse to happen there at all. And the last one was in 993. So over a thousand years ago. And the next one will be in 2241. And August 8, 2241. Which is really amazing because that actually happens to be on the Jewish calendar the year 6001. So if eclipses do represent some kind of transition for mankind, then that's a significant time because we know the calendar ends at the year 6000 for us. Uh, like history as we know, as we discussed a few weeks ago, we have like the 6,000 year history of the world. So, you know, it, the next eclipse in Israel, Dafka just happens to be in the year 6,001. And the last one, it's been over a thousand years since you've seen a total eclipse. I'm talking about a total eclipse, not a partial eclipse. But you, you, the, the last time you had a total eclipse in Israel was over a thousand years ago. So it's another sign that perhaps eclipses really are significant as like a shift, some kind of spiritual paradigm shift. And uh, another thing to remember, just a little bit of a astronomy review, a solar eclipse is when you have the moon blocking the sun. And so you have to be in a specific point to see it. You have to be in a specific path to see it because the moon, of course, is very small. The earth is very big. The sun is very big. So you have to be in a specific place 
so that the moon exactly blocks out the sun. Now that's in itself really amazing. I think it's one of the biggest proofs that we have for the existence of God, of a creator, that there is a design to the cosmos. Because how can it be that the sun is so massive and the moon is so tiny, and yet the moon is able to exactly block out the sun in the sky? Yeah, like the, moon, the sun's diameter is 400 times bigger than the moon's. But one of the amazing things, one of these you know, coincidences in, in space is that the, the sun is also 400 times further away than the moon. So the sun is 400 times wider in diameter, but also 400 times bigger and uh, sorry, 400 times further away. And it just so amazingly happens that the sun and moon are just about the same size in the night sky. So the moon is actually able to perfectly block out the sun. So I think that that's one of the most amazing proofs of like God's fingerprints in creation, that what are the odds that it just so happened that the moon and the sun have this like perfect relationship with each other. I find that to be pretty amazing. And so uh, for a solar eclipse, the moon is blocks out the sun and you have to be at a specific spot on the planet. A lunar eclipse, which happens more frequently, is when the earth gets between the moon and the sun. And so then the earth blocks out the sun from hitting the moon. So then the moon goes dark. So you have a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse. The lunar eclipse is visible from everywhere in the world because in that case, it's the earth that's blocking the moon. So anybody who's looking up at the moon would see it blacked out, assuming that it's nighttime for you. So a lunar eclipse is visible for everyone. And we do have a lunar eclipse coming March 25th, but it's only a partial eclipse. The next total lunar eclipse, which will be a blood moon, which I'm going to get to, is next year, March 14, 2025, which is also Purim. So it's another significant correspondence of dates. So we have a, sol a total solar eclipse April 8th, and then a total lunar eclipse next March on your birthday on Purim 2025. And remember the moon, because like if the moon's going around the earth, and it takes 29 and a half days for the moon to go around the earth. That's why our months are all either 29 or 30 days, right? The Hebrew calendar months are 29 or 30 days. There's no 31 day month because lunar, a lunar month, at the time it takes for the moon to go around the earth is 29 and a half days. So one month you have 29 days, then the next month you need to have 30 days, then 29 and then 30, because you can't have half a day. That's also why Rosh Chodesh jumps from being two days to one day, two days, one day, right? You notice that? Sometimes Rosh Chodesh is two days, sometimes it's one day. So why do you need a Rosh Chodesh that's two days? Because there's that half day. And so if it's a short month of 29 days, you have a one day Rosh Chodesh, but then like you're half a day short. So in the next month, you have a two day Rosh Chodesh because really it's like the half, you're making up for the half day plus the first day. Right? So you, we alternate between 29 and 30 days because a lunar month is 29 and a half days. And so if the moon's going around the earth, why don't lunar eclipses happen uh, or solar eclipses happen every month? Because shouldn't the moon just constantly block out the sun every time it goes around the earth? And anybody know why it doesn't happen? Right, there's a slant, right? There's a five degree tilt. So the moon is kind of, it's not going in like perfectly horizontal. It's like a bit off. So it's going over, it's going under, it's going over, it's going under. And then every so often, it could happen as much as twice a year that you'll have some partial eclipse where the moon will block the sun or the earth will block the sun from hitting the moon. You're right. It usually happens in the spring and in the fall. Yeah. And that's just the way the trajectory of these, all these celestial bodies. Okay. So uh, for the solar eclipse, you have to be at a specific place in the world to see it. We happen to be lucky. We're going to be able to see it here in Toronto, a total eclipse which is pretty amazing. If you've never seen one before, uh, take a sick day from work. I already got my school to give us the afternoon off and ordering eclipse glasses for everybody. Get your eclipse glasses, buy them now because they're going to be sold out within a couple of weeks. They're like the special mirror glasses so that you can stare at the sun because otherwise you're going to burn your eyes and your retinas. Uh, so if you want to see the whole thing, it's going to be like over a, roughly a two hour period. And then the totality part will happen for about three minutes, around 3.18 to 3.20 p.m. Two, three minutes, you're going to have like the sun completely blocked by the moon. And then you're just going to see like an outline of the sun around. So it's going to be pretty amazing. And it's one in a series of 
amazing astronomical events that we have happening. We already spoke about the comet that's supposed to show up in the night sky in the end of September. So this is just another thing in these astronomical signs of amazing things to come. So what does it mean though? What is the spiritual significance of an eclipse? What does it mean? We have a whole page in the Gemara in Masachet Sukkah which talks about eclipses, solar and lunar. So it says like this, Tanu Rabbanan, Bizman Shechama Loka. So our sages taught, when the sun is eclipsed, what do you think? Good sign or bad sign? Okay, let's see. So Siman Ra Lechol Olam Kulo. It's a bad sign for the whole world. A solar eclipse apparently is a bad sign for the whole world. What is this like analogous to? Like a king who makes a big feast for his servants. And he put a big uh, chandelier, a lantern for them to have a nice illuminated party. And then Ka'asalem, but then he got mad at them. So what did he say? And he told the servant, Take away their lights and let them just sit in darkness. Right? So it's like, that's the analogy. It's as if God is mad at us and he's blocking out the sun. Then, Tanya Rabbi Meir Omer. So Rabbi Meir teaches, any time that the luminaries are eclipsed, uh, so it's a bad sign for the haters of Israel. For the haters. But what does it mean, haters of Israel? So this is a little bit strange because it says haters of Israel, but actually the simple meaning here is not the haters of Israel. It's actually a bad sign for Israel. So the Gemara sometimes uses uh, euphemism, Actually, this is a dysphemism where it's going to use, it's really referring to Israel, but it doesn't want to say that something bad will happen to Israel. So it says something bad will happen to the haters of Israel, but it means Israel. Okay, so it's like a little confused logic, but it's to avoid saying something bad will happen to Israel. So it's a bad sign for actually for Israel. And that means because they are used to getting beaten up okay something like that or you can if you want to interpret it the other way that it's a bad sign for the actual haters of israel not for israel but the enemies of israel because they are always beating up the jews and who don't deserve it so you can interpret it either way the simple way as as later will be clear so nehon shel israel really means the jewish people but it's using like the opposite terminology because you don't want to say that something bad will happen to the Jewish people. That's the idea. So it's like a teacher who comes to school and he has a strap in his hands. Uh, and who is worried when the teacher comes to school and he's in a bad mood and he has the strap ready for the kids to have beatings back when kids used to get beatings at school. So who's worried? Which students are worried when the teacher comes with the strap? So the kid who's always getting beaten, he's worried. So the Jewish people who are always getting beaten, we're kind of already on edge. And we're like, okay, is this going to happen again? Are we getting beaten up again? So that's what Rabbi Meir says. And then it continues. So this is already what you were saying. So when the sun is eclipsed, it's a bad sign for the nations of the world. So not for the Jewish people, but for the nations of the world. But if it's a lunar eclipse, so now again, if it's a lunar eclipse, it's a bad sign for Israel. So a solar eclipse is a bad sign for the other nations. A lunar eclipse is a bad sign for Israel. Why? Because we follow the lunar calendar. Uh, we follow lunar months. But the nations follow a solar calendar. Now, the truth is that we don't actually follow a strictly lunar calendar. We follow a loony solar calendar because we follow lunar months, but over 19 years, we always stay synchronized to the sun. So we have a loony solar calendar. So we're both sun and moon. The Muslims use a strictly lunar calendar. They don't intercalate. They don't have like, a, like we do, like this year, a darbet to stay in tune with, in sync with the sun. So the Muslim calendar always falls short like 11 days a year because you only have 354 days in a lunar calendar, which is why Ramadan can happen any time of the year. It can happen in the fall, it can happen next week, it can happen whenever, uh, because every year their lunar year falls behind 11 days from the solar year. So everything kind of gets completely non-synchronized. 
So the Muslims use a, Muslims use a strictly lunar calendar. And, you know, it's interesting that today the symbol of Islam became the moon, the crescent moon. So maybe we should rewrite this Gemara that uh, a lunar eclipse is bad for the Muslims because they follow a strictly lunar calendar. And we follow a loony solar calendar. And then we have the 365 day solar calendar, kind of secular Christian calendar. If it happens, Lokaba Mizrach, if it happens in the east, it's Siman Rale Yoshre Mizrach. It's a bad sign for the people that live there. But Ma'arav, if it happens in the west, Siman Rale Yoshre Ma'arav. So it really depends on where you're located. Because, like we said, it depends if you see it or not. If the eclipse is not visible, then it doesn't count because it's supposed to be a sign for the people. So if the people don't see the eclipse, then it doesn't mean anything. So we are getting to see this eclipse now in North America. They're not going to see it in Asia or anywhere else. So this is a sign for us. It's something for us to worry about or be happy about. I don't know. Uh, we're here in North America because we're seeing this eclipse here. So it all depends on who gets to see it. And that's who it's a sign for. All right. Now it's going to give different examples of a lunar eclipse. Panav domin ladam. If it's a lunar eclipse, that's a blood moon. So sometimes it's going to be the moon just goes dark. Other times, usually when it's a total lunar eclipse, it actually turns red. If you've ever seen a blood moon, you ever see one? There was one in 2010. I remember staying up all night and watching it. It wasn't that impressive. It's not as impressive as a solar eclipse. But the lunar eclipse, is if it uh, turns red, it's a blood moon. And what's that? That's a sign of cherev bala olam. It's a sign of wars to come. So it's a blood moon. It's a sign of wars. That's what it is. So next year, we're going to have a blood moon. Lesak, if the moon doesn't turn bloody, it just goes dark, like a sackcloth. Apparently, that's a sign of famine that's coming. If it's like a little bit of both, so it could be both. Bad signs, essentially, ominous signs. But when the Jewish people do God's will, and if we are righteous, ain mityarin mikol elu. Don't be scared of anything. There's nothing to fear, because it's all in our hands, anyways. If we're righteous, we don't get punished. Shenemar, and there's a verse to prove it in Yirmiyahu. Jeremiah said, "Ko amar Hashem el derech agoim al tilmedu." Don't learn the ways of the nations. Umeotot hashemaim al techatu, and don't be scared of the signs of heaven. Why? Ki echatu agoim mehema, because the nations do these kinds of things and look for astrological signs and we don't. So we shouldn't look at these things as bad signs for us. So what is the Gemara really saying here? It seems like strange. Like you're saying, hey, don't be like the nations who look at the stars and do these like predicting the future horoscope kind of thing. Uh, as we know, the Gemara says somewhere else, Ein mazal Israel. there's no constellation for the Jewish people. God says, I'm your constellation. If you do what I say, everything will be fine. That's all you have to remember. So what is this really saying, this verse? So the Gemara just gave us a whole bunch of signs. And it says, oh, but like, don't worry about them because we're not supposed to look at the signs. If you really break down this verse, it's saying, look, if you're not going to do God's will, then what's the difference between you and the nations? Nothing. Then you become like the Goim. And the Goim do are affected by the stars and the constellations. Whatever natural phenomena happen to them will happen to you. If you're going to be, do what you're supposed to be doing and do God's will, then you, are, you become supernatural. That's what God tells us throughout the Torah, that a Jew is supposed to be supernatural above nature. If you do what I do, you become like me. Kadoshim tihiyuki kadoshani. You should be holy because I'm holy. You become like me. And the Mishnah says you're supposed to be, do God's will and then he does your will. You align your will with God's will. So if you make your will like God's will, God makes his will like your will. You align your will with God's and then it's like you transcend this physical world. So our job is to do God's will so that we are not subject to all of these natural phenomena. We become supernatural. Yeah. This is the sun represents Torah Shebekav. Yeah. And the moon represents Torah Shebekav. All right. Yes, the sun has significance for us as well. Actually, Kabbalistically, the sun is associated with the Sphira of Tiferet. And Tiferet is the root sphira of the Jewish people. And the land of Israel, the people of Israel, is in specifically in Tiferet. 
And we mentioned this before, that Tiferet, the Zohar says in the Arizal, says has 365 lights, which is why the sun, the solar year, has 365 days. It comes from, because the physical world is only a reflection of the spiritual world. So just like in the spiritual world, that Sphira of Tiferet has 365 lights shining from it, that manifests itself in the physical world as a solar year of 365 days. So Israel is also connected to the sun. And we're supposed to be la or goim, right? A light unto the nation. So we are supposed to be illuminating the world. That is our purpose. So we are also parallel to the sun. And yet at other times, we're parallel to the moon. Especially Yaakov is called like the moon. Israel is called the sun, but Yaakov is called the moon. Beit Israel or Bnei Israel are called the sun, but Beit Yaakov is called the moon. And then also masculine, feminine, right? Bnei Israel is considered more the masculine aspect, which is associated with the sun. And Beit Yaakov is considered uh, the feminine aspect, which is the moon. That's why a girl's school is called traditionally a Beit Yaakov, right? A Beis Yaakov, because like it says in the Torah, when God gave at Mount Sinai, God referred to the Jewish people as Bnei Israel and Beit Yaakov, the, the sons of Israel and Beit Yaakov, the house of Jacob. And the root of Beit, of house, and Bat, a girl, is the same. So like the woman is like the home. As it says in Masachet Yoma, the first Mishnah over there, that a man's wife is his house, right? Beito zuishto, that a man's house is his wife. A man doesn't have a house. The house is for the woman. <laughs> the, the man's house is his wife. Beit Yaakov is the feminine and the moon, and Beit Bnei Israel is the sun and the masculine. So they all have significance for us. Yes. All right. And then it says like this. So we're going to just go finish this page. There's four reasons why there's a solar eclipse. Four reasons for why God sends a solar eclipse. When an Av Beidin dies and is not mourned properly. So I remember back then when there was a Sanhedrin, there was the president of the Sanhedrin, who was the Nasi, and then the second in command was the Av Beidin like the head of the, literally the head of the court, the Supreme, the Supreme Court Justice, like the main, sometimes translated as the vice president. So you had the Nasi and the Av Beidin. So this is a strange statement. What does that mean? It's very puzzling. Even Rashi says, you know what Rashi says here? He says, Lo shamati tam I don't know what this means. Right? Like, I have no idea what, what exactly that represents. Uh, then, so that's one reason. When an Av Beidin dies and he's not mourned properly, and on a young maiden who is betrothed, engaged, and she is, God forbid, getting assaulted, and she's screaming, and there's nobody to save her. And on sodomy. And when two brothers are slaughtered, and two innocent brothers are slaughtered together as one. So these are the sins that God says, for these things I send a solar eclipse, which is a bad sign for the world. And if you think about what we've witnessed in the past like six months, we've had a lot of all of this, right? A lot of mourning and sometimes mourning that we couldn't do because you, you know, people's bodies weren't found and people were, God forbid, you know, turned into ash. And so mourning that wasn't done, we couldn't mourn people and women who got abused and raped and nobody ain't Moshiela and couldn't be saved. And Mishkav Zahu, which is sodomy. And I mean, even with what happened in Israel, these Hamas Nikim also, unfortunately, like sodomy. So also that, they, uh, they abused everybody, right? Men, women, the same way. And innocent brothers getting slaughtered for no reason. So either, there, that's a, a big question. There is an, some have an understanding that Mishkav Zahur is when you, a man specifically harms another man, not voluntarily. So there is an understanding of, so there's a question of whether sodomy is voluntary. Like if two men engaged in this voluntarily, is that considered sodomy or not? Or is sodomy only when it's violent? When a man gets abused by another man, and not willingly. It's because the people of Sdom, what was their thing? If you remember what actually happened in Sdom is that they were violently saying, give us the men, we're going to abuse them. So it was, it was not like, let's do this consensually. Right? So the sin of Sodom was 
a non-consensual thing where they said, give us those men, we will rape them. Yeah, because okay. yeah, the term sodomy doesn't appear in Hebrew. That, in, that, in those words. So, again, it's a, I, I think we can interpret it as any mishkav zechu, which in the wider world has become the norm now. You have every year parades of this stuff, and they do it openly in the middle of the street, in sight of everybody. So I think you can interpret it either as that this is something happening consensually and openly, and it's become accepted. And you can also interpret it as in the context of what it's saying here. It's, all, it's saying negative things of like rape and murder and sodomy. You see what I mean? In the context, it seems like it's something violent and not consensual. So that's the four reasons why uh, a solar, e- a total eclipse might happen. But I have a question. So if this happens, then there's going to be a total eclipse. But then before you said that solar eclipse means bad things will happen. So right. Like, so I mean, sins happen, there's a solar eclipse, and then the punishment. So the solar eclipse is a sign that, hey, you've done these terrible things, now I'm going to punish you for it. Right, that's, right, so that's what we have to ask. Right, so good. That's the, the big classic question. One more before I get to that question, just to finish this paragraph. Uh, and why do other eclipses, or the, a lunar eclipse also, the other four was just for solar eclipses. What about other, uh, a lunar eclipse? And in general, eclipses, four reasons. Al-Kotve Plaster, which means people who write fraudulent documents, okay, forgers and fraudulent stuff. Val Meide du Tsheker, similar, people who lie, who give false testimony. Ve'al Migdale Behemad Daka Be'eretz Israel, which is a weird one, uh, on account of people raising small pets, domesticated animals in Israel. Why, why is that a problem? That needs to be discussed. And the al not to vote, and for destroying trees, good trees, for environmental destruction. So there's four other reasons for eclipses. So f- people writing fake documents, people giving false testimony. So that's the whole world is full of that today. All the fake news, all the propaganda, all the nonsense scientific on the internet. Scientific yes, that's right. All the so-called scientific research, all the so-called. Um, Hollywood stuff, the accusing the wrong side of genocide, ironically, you know, the side that's not, you know, the side that was actually committing genocide gets all the support from the world and the other side is getting accused of genocide. So it's all, it's all upside down. So this is it. So the Gemara says on all this forgery and fake news and false testimony, uh, for that, you get uh, signs of eclipse as well. And for environmental destruction, which we see enough of in the world today. Now, back to the classic question. None of this seems to make any sense for the obvious reason that eclipses are very easy to predict. You can predict eclipses hundreds of years in advance, thousands of years in advance. It's actually really simple. Uh, our, our calendar was fixed by Hillel II, Hillel Nesia, not the first one, but Hillel II in the fourth century because the Sanhedrin was disbanded and we couldn't have the old way of making the calendar, of course, was people would come, witnesses would come to the Sanhedrin and there would be a sighting of the moon and a new month would be declared, right? And then once the Sanhedrin was disbanded in the fourth century, we didn't have that anymore. So Hillel and his um, council basically set together, created the calendar that we have to this day. Although it wasn't like it's, it was adjusted here and there through the period of the Geonim, but essentially the calendar was set over a thousand years ago. And they also knew how to calculate eclipses. And they used the dates of eclipses to make sure that their calendar is set properly. And the Mishnah says, you know, that knowledge of astronomy, of tkufot, of all these calculating, all these periods and solar eclipses and lunar eclipses and all the motions of the planets. That's one of the signs of wisdom. It's a condiment of wisdom. So our sages knew how to do this. So what does that mean then? If we know how to calculate eclipses, how can it be that it's a sign of people committing sins, right? In fact, the oldest known computer is, a sol- is an eclipse predictor. And it was discovered off the coast of Greece, off an island called Antikythera. You've heard of this? This Antikythera mechanism is about 2,200 years old, and it's made of a whole bunch of gears, and it actually calculates eclipses. 
And you can use it to calculate, to predict, they, they, they made a model of it, like a rebuilt model of it, and you could use it to predict the current eclipse on April 8th. I saw a model of it built, and they used predicted the next eclipse on April 8th. So you can actually, but even back then, it's, it's considered by some the first known calculator, because using a set of gears that multiplied by a whole bunch of phenomena and celestial phenomena, it could spit out for you the dates of eclipses as you run this cycle. The Antikythera mechanism that the Greeks built actually uses the current cycle of eclipses, which is called the Saros cycle. There's different types of eclipses, different patterns. So this particular one is called the Saros cycle. It's Saros 139. And a Saros is 223 lunar months. So it basically cycles every 223 lunar months, which is just about 18 years. And so every roughly 18 years, you'll have this type of eclipse. So this particular one is the 30th of the cycle. The first one was in 1501. The last one was in 2006. The next one will be in 2042. So they happen roughly 18 years apart. And there's 71 of them in total. And so 71 eclipses in this particular cycle. This is the 30th one. And 30, you know, is a special number in the Torah and in Hebrew. Why is 30 a special number, amen? 30 has a, a lot of significance. 30, the, 30 is Lamed, right? Lamed is 30. What's special about Lamed? Lamed is the only letter that goes above the line that reaches up, right? All the other letters are like straight or go down, but Lamed is the only one that goes up. It goes up to Hashem. It's reaching up to heaven. Actually, if you split it, you know, every letter in Hebrew is made up of four, sorry, three smaller letters. It's either a Yud, a Vav, and a Kaf. So it's like a dot, a line, or like a cuff, like a, a plane, a two-dimensional thing. So a lamed is a cuff and a vav, right? The way you do a lamed is a vav above the line and a cuff. So the value of that is actually 26, right? The inner value of the lamed is God's name. It's yud hey vav hey is 26. So the lamed is like reaching up to God. And the lamed means literally to learn and to teach, right? Lilmod and lilamed. So the root of learning, teaching, growing, you know, spiritual development, personal growth, that's all represented by Lamed, which is going up to Hashem. It's like the human being striving to reach God. So 30 is a significant number, right? The Mishnah says that Shloshim Lakoch, that 30, when you hit the age of 30, that's when you have real strength. That's when you're fully developed. And we know that today scientifically too, because your brain keeps developing into your 20s, right? And the brain doesn't really finish development until the late 20s, until about 30. And you see in the, in the Torah, uh, a lot of our heroes reach their position at 30. Like Yosef became the president of Egypt when he was 30. And King David became the king of Israel when he was 30. And there's all these like patterns of 30. The Levim would only serve in the temple when they were 30. So there's all these patterns of 30 in Tanakh. So 30 is a special number. It represents koach, strength, reaching up to God, like spiritual elevation. So it's a special, it's a special number. But anyway, this is the 30th uh, particular eclipse, the longest one so far in this cycle of 71 eclipses. So how do we explain this whole timing issue? If everything is already pre-planned and we knew that this particular eclipse on April 8th will happen hundreds of years ago, 2200 years ago, they already knew that this eclipse will happen. So how do we explain it? So there's a few ways to explain it. One. The Ben Yo Yada, which the Ben Ishai comments here, and he asks this question. He says, de chama velevana hu tiv'i. These are natural things. They're tiv'i. Tochanim kodem that they're known already. They're known long in advance. So he says, Vadai, that for certainly it's natural. So what does this mean? It just means that Bizman mekatregim lekatreg, that God programmed them throughout creation, throughout history. And when these eclipses happen, what, what God does is he gives basically like, he frees the mekatregim, the heavenly prosecutors, the angels that are responsible for going out into the world and kind of finding people's sins and judging them. They are released during eclipses. So the Ben Ishchai says that during eclipses, that's when the Mekatregim are let loose and they can go and do what they need to do. So, 
So it's a bad sign only because these spiritual forces come out into the world and could potentially like judge and create trouble, assuming that you deserve it. So if you're righteous, nothing will happen. Like the Gemara says, you have nothing to worry about. But if people are sinful and they deserve punishment, then those mekatregim, those spiritual forces are given permission to go and punish. So that's how the Ben Ishai explains it. He's saying that it's already pre-planned from creation, but these are set times, like every 18 years or whatever, you have the, the mekatregim are set forth from the heavens and come down to earth. That's one way to explain it. Right? The other way to explain it is simply that God already knew all of history. So he knew when certain times and places will be sinful. And he made sure that the paths of the eclipses will fit in those exact times and places. Right? So it seems maybe far-fetched, but why not? If he made the sun and moon in their exact sizes, 400 times bigger and 400 times further away, and everything is so precise, and we know we have a saying that no blade of grass grows without an angel telling it to, you know, or God sending some emissary to make it do its thing. So God kind of pre-programmed everything anyways. So that's another way to understand it is God knew that North America would need to see a total solar eclipse on April 8th, 2024, because he knew what would be happening around this time of, you know, this time in this place long in advance. So and, and the reality is that it's pretty rare to see a total eclipse because you have to again, you have to be in a specific spot. Most of the earth is uninhabited, you know, maybe like only three percent of the world is inhabited. So the chances of seeing it in an inhabited place is really low. And the Gemara says that it only applies if it's actually happening in that place. If that inhabited place sees the eclipse, then it, it matters and means something. And then, of course, yeah, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> it's going to be amazing to see. Everybody should go and see it, because hopefully maybe it'll inspire the non tzaddikim to repent. Yeah. yeah, so that's the next question that I want to cover. Should you make a bracha on it? It seems to be the Allah consensus is not to make a bracha on it, and it's not clear why. Like the, the Mishnah, where it has different brachot for different things, doesn't specifically have a bracha for an eclipse, but it does have a bracha for generally amazing natural phenomena, where you can say like, Right? For creatures, for like living things. But would be for natural phenomena. Right? There's which when you hear like lightning and things like, or you hear thunder and you see lightning and these kinds of things that tremors, earthquakes, that you feel like God's power. And for this, for something visual, you could say Osema Bereshit. There's no specific blessing for an eclipse. You could say that one. Some people say you shouldn't say a blessing on an eclipse because it's a negative sign and we don't want to make a blessing on something negative. However, the same Mishnah in Barachot actually says, Chayav adam keshem tova, that a person really should bless the bad also. Thank God for everything he sends your way, the good and the bad. Right? Like Isaac, one of my favorite quotes is Isaac Newton who said, he said that everything God sends our way is a medicine that's, that we need. God is our gracious physician. Every medicine he sends us is because we need it and we should thank him for the prescription. Uh, he said it a lot more eloquently than that. But in other words, what this Mishnah is saying, that you should thank God even for the bad things that happen to you, not just for the good things. So in, with that in mind, I think you could say a blessing on an eclipse because it is really a breathtaking phenomenon. And if you feel like it's something also just amazing and inspires you to grow closer to God, which I think it will for a lot of people. Hopefully it won't be cloudy and it won't be bad weather or a snow, sudden snowstorm, but hopefully we'll actually see it. And I think it'll be very inspiring because it's, it's quite a sight to behold. So if anything, it should inspire people to repent because that's really the point, right? God gives us the signs so that it causes within us like something that makes us say, okay, I have to change my actions because God doesn't want to punish us. So God sends us the signs so that we can repent and hopefully avert the signs. Because the rule is that negative prophecies don't have to be materialized because God sends them our way as a warning. So hopefully we'll take the warning and repent. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think you can see it as a positive sign also that 
God is still here and God cares about us. So it's bright, then it's dark, but then it's bright again. So it's like a temporary darkness, but it's for our own benefit. And so you should... Yeah. When you see, I think the whole point of the sages instituting all those blessings is that if you feel a sense of awe, then you should say the bracha, right? So if you go to Niagara Falls and you see it, you're supposed to say a bracha, but like it should come from a sense of awe. Now, the Tanakh only speaks of eclipses, just going back to actual, what does the Tanakh actually say? We saw what the Gemara says, that's basically it. What does the Tanakh say about eclipses? It's mentioned in maybe like three places, kind of, but the main place where it's spoken of twice is in a book that people are usually not familiar with. Anybody know where it's mentioned? In Yoel, Sefer Yoel. Do you even know what that? Mm. Never even heard of it. <laughs> so Yoel is one of the so-called minor prophets, right? The Treyasav. There's 12 prophets that are called minor prophets, although they're not minor. They're just as major as all the other prophets, but they're just called that way because they're short. So they were all lumped together into one scroll. So there's one scroll of 12 prophets. So like Yonah is one of them, right? What we read on Yom Kippur, everybody knows that one because it costs a lot of money and to get it <laughs> but everybody knows Yona, but Yoel people don't know so we want to look up uh see what Yoel says because he mentions eclipses twice and who is Yoel we actually don't know much about him that's another reason why people are not familiar with the book of Yoel which is just four chapters very short we don't really know who he was and we don't really have any stories about him uh but interestingly enough we know where his grave is and you can go to Israel today and you can see it. It's in the north in Gush Chalav. And already 500 years ago, the Arizal identified it. Because in Shara Gilgulim, in chapter 8, there's a list of where the Arizal identified the graves of various tzaddikim in, the, in that area in the north of Israel, around Tzfat and Tveria and all that. So he identifies the grave of Yoel, of the prophet Yoel, Yoel ben Petuel. And it's in Gush Chalav which used to be an important place historically. It's called Giscala in Roman t- terms. So there was a famous uh, hero, John of Giscala, Yohanan of Gush Chalav, who fought against the Romans and beat them at one point in one battle. So it's a, it's a place of historical significance, and there is a tomb there of Yoel. And another book that parallels Shara Gilgulim, which is Sefer Gilgulei Neshamot, which we quoted a whole bunch of times already, it actually says who Yoel is because we know that there's another person in Tanakh who is called Yoel. The other person in Tanakh who is called Yoel is, anybody know? The son of Shmuel, of Samuel the prophet. So if you remember, Shmuel was the judge of Israel. And then after him was the first king of Israel, which was Shaul, and then came King David. So how did we go from having judges to having kings? How did that transition take place? Because for hundreds of years, Israel is led by Shoftim. Israel is led by judges. So how do we go from judges to kings? Why did that happen? If everything was going all right for centuries and they lived with Shoftim, why did they suddenly get a king? They wanted kings like the other nations, but why? What inspired them to want to have kings? So it says in Shmuel, in chapter 8, So Shmuel got old, and he appointed his sons to be the judges of Israel. And guess what happened? Uh, so first of all, it says their names. So his oldest was Yoel. Yoel was the son of Samuel, the prophet. And the second son was Avia. Shoftim be'er Sheva, and they were based in Be'er Sheva. And what happened? Velo alchu banav bidracho. And the sons of Shmuel did not behave themselves like Shmuel did. They took bribes. They were corrupt. And they kushochad, veyatu mishpat, and they twisted judgment. So they sold out. And they kaptsu kol ziknei Israel. And that's when all the elders of Israel came. Ve'yavo el Shmuel haRamata, and they came to Shmuel in Rama where he lived. You're old and your sons are not following in your path. They are wicked. And therefore, we want a king. We don't want judges anymore. So actually, Yoel is the reason why, the first Yoel, Yoel the son of Shmuel, is the reason why there was kingdom, at the physical reason, the simple historical reason, for why there was a kingdom 
why the kingdom of Israel emerged, why the period of judges ended and the period of kings emerged, because the judges had become corrupt. Yoel and the Avia became corrupt, and that's why the people got fed up with the judges and said, we want a king, and that would eventually lead to the Davidic dynasty. Right. So he was telling them it's not going to make a difference because humans are all corrupt, whether they're judges or kings. So, yeah, I think they want they they felt like the shoftim are have no authority to rule. Where do they come from? They're just you know you appointed your own sons. We want a king, and we're going to have a say in how the king runs the country. It's going to be like a constitutional monarchy because if you notice about David, for instance. How, was, how did David become king? That's something that we also tend to overlook. How did David become the king of Israel? Yeah, it says that they elected him. Same thing with Shaul. It, like Shmuel went and anointed King David, but he was still a child and nobody saw that. That was done privately in the home of Ishai. So nobody saw Shmuel anointing David as king. And then Shmuel was already gone. When David was appointed king, Samuel wasn't there. How did it happen? The Tanakh says clearly that the people elected him as their king. So the system of monarchy here is somewhat like a constitutional monarchy where the people elect the king and they have some say in government, essentially. So I think that's what they wanted. They wanted a king who is following Torah law, who's going to have some Sanhedrin, who's going to be able to like rein him in when necessary. Like we saw with King David, that when he sinned, the Sanhedrin expelled him, you know, for six months or whatever. So I think that's what they wanted. They wanted more accountability. Exactly. <laughs> we don't want Shoftim, we want Melachim. But, but like you said, Shmuel said it's not going to make a difference because, you know, people will, all people can tend towards corruption. So, but yeah, they thought that that's going to solve the problem. And uh, so the Ramah Mifano says in Sefer Gilgulein Shamot, who are Yoel ve Avia? He says that uh, Yoel, the son of Shmuel, is... Ben Petuel, is Yoel the prophet. That's why they have the same name. So Yoel, the son of Samuel, came back and reincarnated because he was corrupt in his past life. So he had to come back and do a tikkun and rectify his soul. And he did. It's actually a success story. So he was able to rectify himself and he reached such a high level, it says that that he was such a righteous person that he even merited to have the Holy Spirit and Ruach HaKodesh and became a prophet. So that's what he's saying. So it's the same Yoel. And so the Yoel, the son of Samuel, reincarnated as the prophet Yoel. And when he lived, probably at the end, it seems like he lived at the end of the first temple period because his prophecy is describing the destruction of the first temple and the war with Babylon, seemingly. So that's when he reincarnated. And there's an irony there in this reincarnation because the first Yoel is the reason why the Davidic dynasty arose in the first place. Because of the corruption of Yoel, the people asked for a king. And so there's an irony here because then he came back as a prophet he came back, he rectified himself, merited to become a prophet, and then he prophesied the return of the Davidic dynasty and, you know, the time of the restoration of the monarchy eventually in the end of days. So it kind of completes the whole circle. So what does he say? We're not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to point out a few. You should read the whole thing. It's very short. It's just four chapters, so it's worth reading. And I'm just going to point out some key words that jumped out at me because it's so similar to what we just experienced in the past, you know, six months or whatever. So you can read the whole thing. And again, this is essentially what you would call a double level prophecy, where on the one hand, he's telling us what's going on in his day. He's telling us about the Babylonian war and the destruction of the temple. But on the other hand, we know that everything in Tanakh is a prophecy for the future. The Tanakh is not a history book. Right? We, that's not what it's for. The Tanakh is a book of prophecy. So everything, even historical details in the Tanakh, are actually prophecies about the future for us. So although on the surface he's describing what was going on with the Babylonians and the destruction of the temple, it's also a prophecy for the end of days, as is clear because he hints to the end of days every now and then. So chapter one, he says like this, Kigoy ala atzum, so like a large number of, has entered us, ve'en mispar shinav, shine ariyeh, fangs of lions and whatever. And what did they do? Some gafni leshama, and they destroyed my vineyards, uteinati, and my fig orchards, 
my fig trees, they've destroyed, and and they've turned everything, they've burned it, and they've chopped it up, and they've destroyed the fields and the farms. Shudad uh, Sadeh, so again, they're destroying all the fields, the grains, the Dagan Hovish, Tirosh Umla Litzar, so they're destroying all the wine, all the oil, all the agriculture. Hovishu Ikarim, Helilu Kramim, Al Chita, Ve'al Seora, so the wheat and the barley and all that, the, the, the harvests have been lost. Hagefen, Hovisha, the grapes are drying out. Ve'ataena, Umlala, Rimon, Gam Tamar, so he's listing actually the whole seven species of Israel, the wheat and the barley and the grapes and the figs and the dates and the pomegranates. Yeah, did I miss one? The olives. And then it actually lists one more here. Anybody know what it is? It adds to the seven species of Israel one more fruit. So the Torah tells us the seven species of Israel, but this verse adds one more. Tapuach and an apple, the apple trees. So they're all drying up. All the fruit trees are drying up. There's nobody there to work them. Because the joy has been taken from the people. Right? So these foreign warriors came in. They destroyed a lot of the farms and the fields and the orchards. And the people are gone and there's no happiness. And the fields are drying up and there's nobody to harvest them. So if you remember what's been going on, if you've seen what's going on, what's been going on the last few months, a lot of the harvests in Israel were lost. A lot of those on the Otef Aza area, the, the border, the lands that border Gaza, there's a lot of farms there. And so many of the workers left, and so they don't know what to do. So a lot of the fields are just sitting there, and the harvests are drying up. And then chapter 2 continues, and it says, Tku shofar batzion, blow a, a shofar in Zion. So make a sound on my holy mountain. So the day of God is near. That's how we know he's talking about the end of days. So the final judgment day is near. And then this verse is just really like striking. Because what's happening, it says, They ran inside our country like these great warriors. And they climbed over the wall. Choma in the singular. And each one took their own path. And there was nobody to uh, stop their paths. They're just walking right in, right? Like nothing. And what, what happened? Ba'ir, they went into the city. Isaku bechoma, Yerutsun babatim. You know, they're destroying houses and they're climbing over walls. And they're running into houses. Ya'alu be'ada chalonim. And they're climbing in through windows. Right? ganav. And they come in like thieves. Right? These are not like your regular soldiers that are fighting in a battlefield. These are people running in to inhabited areas, into windows, like thieves. And keep in mind that the word ganav, what does ganav actually mean? Because ganav is sometimes translated incorrectly. Because... Yeah, ganav. Some people think when, when in the Ten Commandments it says lotignov, right? What does that mean, lotignov? It's translated as do not steal. But it doesn't mean do not steal. How do we know that it can't mean do not steal in the Ten Commandments? First of all, because the word for theft is gezel. Petty theft is gezel. So what's gneva? It's not the same. We know, right, the Ten Commandments we know are all punishable by death. Each of the Ten Commandments, if you break the transgress them, they're all punishable by death. Petty theft is not punishable by death. Lotignov is one of the Ten Commandments. So how can it be punishable by death? So the proper translation of Lotignov is do not kidnap, not to steal people. Right? Gneva, actually, the biblical definition is the stealing and trafficking and kidnapping of people. So here it says they're coming into houses through windows like Ganavim. They're there to kidnap people. Yeah. He's talking about the Babylonians, essentially. Right? That's what we think, because he doesn't specify. So Yoel doesn't actually say who he's talking about. So we're not sure, but it seems to be that he's talking about the Babylonians and the destruction of the first temple. Right, exactly. So that's what I'm saying. Remember, chapter 2 was prefaced by saying, this is what's going to happen before the Yom Hashem. So this is clearly, this is when you read Tanakh, you have to kind of switch between 
history and prophecy, history and prophecy. So he's describing a, a current phenomenon for his day, but also looking far into the future. And he's saying this was going to happen before the day of God. Right? And then there's a, a, a comforting, a positive verse, a message for the IDF. So Yoel has a message for the IDF. Ve'ashem natan kolo lifnei chelo. But God will give his voice before his army. Ki rav me'od machaneu, ki atzum osed dvaro, ki gadol yom Hashem, v'nora me'od, umi achilenu. So he's saying that God's army is going to be large and they're going to do what God wants them to do and they will ultimately succeed and the day of God is coming, so don't worry. Everything is going to be fine. All right? And then, so God is then telling all of us, turn back to me with all your hearts, and with fasting, you know, cry and fast and pray and mourn. Don't cut your clothing, because you know when people, when we mourn the dead, you're supposed to cut, you're supposed to cut the clothing. But he says, don't cut your clothes, cut your hearts. Right, open up your hearts. That's what he's saying. Don't cut your clothes for all the dead people. Right? Cut your hearts. And return to Hashem your God. Because he's compassionate and gracious. And long suffering. And you know, he will pay back all the evil. Don't worry. Tiku Shafar Betzion, Kadshut Tsom, Kiru Atzara. And this is an important verse because, do, what do you notice about this verse? So blow the Shafar and observe a fast and Karu Atzara. Right, it's the high holiday season, right? Blow a Shafar is Rosh Hashanah and Kadshut Tsom, keep a fast is Yom Kippur and Kiru Atzara. Atzara is at Shmini Atzeret, right? It's Sukkot and Shmini Atzeret, which we know the attack happened on Shmini Atzeret. So saying, make sure you observe the high holidays that's coming up this year. So do it right this upcoming year. And keep in mind the timing. We also saw the prophecy of the star of Jacob. And the Lul 25th, we said, is when the astronomers are saying a comet will appear in the night sky. So maybe it's all coming together for this fall. God willing, maybe this is it. So you have the comet on the 25th. We have the eclipse in a few weeks. We have the comet on the 25th. And then we have Rosh Hashanah, Kippur, Shmini Atzeret. And Yoel is saying, make sure you observe that as it's supposed to be observed properly. This is your chance. Isfu'am, uh, bring everybody together, uh, purify yourselves, right? Kipzuz kenim, isfu'olalim, beyonkei shadaim, everybody, the elders, the young people, chatan mechadro vekala mechupata, the newlyweds, everybody. Ben haulam velamizbeach, yifku akoanim, mishartei Hashem, all those who serve Hashem. The Kohanim, everybody should be crying and coming back to God. That's all we have now. We need a supernatural miracle at this point. And everybody should say, So have mercy on us and don't give away your heritage to cherpa, right? To mockery and to destruction. And uh, yeah, don't give away our inheritance. Limshol bam goim. Okay. Don't let the nation say, where is their God? And then God will have mercy on his people. And God will answer and say, I'll give you back all the grain and the wine and the oil that you lost. And it's never going to happen again. I'm not going to make you a mockery among the nations again. So be happy. I'm going to restore everything like in the old days. I'm going to bring you back your rains, the late rains, the early rains. There's going to be abundant rain. Actually, Israel has had abundant rains recently. So maybe it's already happening. So God is saying, I'm going to restore all the rains. And you will know that I... Hashem, I'm among the people. And you will no longer doubt it ever again. Okay, so we will know that God is among us. And just a little more, chapter 3 says, God says, I will spill my spirit on all people. 
so that even the children, the sons and the daughters will prophesy. So even the young people and the old people will see great visions. It's interesting that recently I'm getting a lot of emails from people all over the world it's to sharing their amazing visions and their dreams and mamash interesting things like all kinds of prophecies, all kinds of things that people are feeling and seeing and are wondering where this is coming from. All kinds of strange experiences, like almost every day from all over the world, all kinds of stories that are really quite unbelievable. Jews and even non-Jews, like you'd be surprised. Emails from Iran, like people, somebody from Brazil, somebody from Australia, like people all over the world, it seems, are feeling something very deep, deeply spiritual. Something is awakening within. And this is what Yoel is saying, that the spirit of prophecy will start to return all over the world, among all people, young and old. And this is where uh, the relevant passage to us. I will give signs in the heavens and the skies. And then a, word, a set of words that you know, that you've said many times. Dam ve'esh right? That we say in the Agadah all the time. You drop the three drops of wine. This is where it comes from. So you may have thought that it has to do with the Agadah, that it has to do with the first redemption, but actually it's Yoel talking about the final redemption. So you spill the 10 drops, if you remember, at the Seder, you spill 10 drops of wine for the 10 plagues in the first redemption, and then Dam Ve'esh V'timrot Ashan. Why this, these ones, right? And, uh, and then there's also an acronym there for the 10 plagues. But you also mentioned Dam Ve'esh V'timrot Ashan, to remember the final redemption. Those are the, the plagues and the signs and the miracles that'll happen in the end of days. And this is the verse in, for us that we were getting to. That was a long introduction to this. Hashemesh ya'afech lachoshech, and the sun will turn dark, ve'ayarech ladam, and the moon will turn to blood. We'll have a blood moon. Lifnei bo yom Hashem agadol ve'anora, before the day of God comes. So we have a solar eclipse on April 8th, a total eclipse. We have a total lunar eclipse and a blood moon next March 14th on Purim and Augusto's birthday. And then and another blood moon on September 7th. So there's this pattern of three in a row that we're going to have. And then chapter four, and we're going to finish with that. And it mentions again uh, in chapter four, after describing all kinds of other events in between, what's going to happen, it actually speaks about the final war again, like the Gogu Magog war. It doesn't use the term Gogu Magog like Ezekiel does, but similar ideas that many different nations will come into Israel and they will go into the Valley of Yehoshaphat. And this is where the final battle, battles will take place and God will judge them and, and so on. But then it, I'm just skipping ahead. And it says again, Shemesh ve'yareach kadaru ve'kochavim asfu nagham. So... This is what we were talking about, that the sun and moon will be darkened and certain stars will appear. They'll change their brightnesses and things like that. So maybe that's the star of Jacob idea. And God will roar out of Zion. And will give his voice from Jerusalem. And and the heavens and the earth will tremble. So that everybody will know. So Jerusalem will finally be holy and no Zarim will pass through it anymore. It says also, I'm just skipping, or you read it yourself, but it says things that are, are really amazing and kind of relative to what, relevant to what we're experiencing now, talking about how the people are being sold and trafficked. And ve'elami yadu goral ve'itnu hayeled bazona. And you know, they take the young girls and treat them like zonot. They whore away the girls. They sell the girls. They take those people that they kidnapped. Yeah. They took, they, it says, they bar, the translation is, it's, it says, they bartered a boy for a whore and sold a girl. And they drank. So the abuse of the children is like described here in pretty graphic language. And it actually does mention some names here. It says, Vegam ma'atem li. And God says, And what about you? Tzor v'tzidon. Tzor and Sidon is where? In Lebanon, right? Sidon and Tyre is in Lebanon. Vechol glilot paleshet. And all the plishtim, all the Palestinians. Right? What are you? Who are you? A made up people. 
הגמול אתם משלמים, uh, משלמים עליי, like what do you think you're doing? ואם גומלים אתם עליי, קל מהרה אשיב גמולכם בראשכם. I'm gonna return to you everything you did. I'm gonna heap it all back onto your heads. ומחמדי הטובים הבאתם להיכלכם. You took my treasures to your היכלכם, to your palaces. Should have said to your tunnels. But <laughs> that's their palaces. They invest more money into their tunnels than into their palaces, right? Billions of dollars that they spent. They could have had palaces and instead they built tunnels. So, yeah, exactly. So you took away my treasures to your tunnels and I'll pay you back uh, many times over. So it says these things in chapter four, so you can read over it in detail. All right, and we'll end with the, the other place where an eclipse is mentioned is in Habakkuk, which is another one of the minor prophets. So the message today is go and read the minor prophets because they're not minor and there's a lot of actually important information there. So they tend to be overlooked, but it's really important. And you know, Perek Shira is the, the book that says what everything in creation is singing to God. Right, we have a, you've heard of this, Perek Shira? It often comes with like a bencher in, in the back of a Birkat Amazon. So it says like the whole cosmos is singing to God. Everything in nature is praising God. And the sun is singing and the moon is singing and the clouds are singing and the heavens and the trees and the animals and every, everybody has a verse that they're singing. So Perak Shira says, what is the sun singing? What does the sun sing? The sun is singing a verse from Habakkuk. From this minor prophet. The verse is Shemesh Yareach Amad Zvula Leor Chitzecha Yelchu Lenoga Barak Chanitecha. That's the verse, which is talking about a solar eclipse. So he's saying the sun, when the moon is standing over the sun, right? Yareach Amad Zvula, when the moon is blocking out the light of the sun, what's going to happen, whatever. It's a sign of arrows and things to come. We already covered that. But then the next verse is Yareach Omeret. What is the moon singing? So the sun is singing about a solar eclipse. That there's something special about a solar eclipse. What is the moon singing? It's a verse in Tehilim. Le-mo'adim, that God made the moon for holidays, for seasons, for us to track, keep track of time, for our calendar, for our lunar months. So God made the moon. Le-mo'adim, and Shemesh Yada Mevo. And the sun knows when he's coming. Interesting. Okay, the sun knows when the end of days is, when the redemption will come. That's one way to understand it. So the sun knows when the end. So look to the sun. If you want to know, if you want to sign for when the day of God is near, look to the sun. So maybe that's what this is. Maybe this is just an, another sign to add to the list of signs that we're building. We have a whole binder of signs that we are, uh, every week we're adding into our, our folder. So you can add one more. What's that? Yeah, exactly. They're all coming together. So you can add one more sign to this uh, set of events that's going to happen over the next year. We have a solar eclipse. We have this planet. We have a planetary alignment first, which is interesting. But we have a, sol- a total solar eclipse. We have a comet in the sky. We have a, a blood moon next year. And we have all these other prophecies that we've gone th- through from the Zohar, from Ezekiel, from the Midrash, and Yelkut Shimoni, and now here in Yoel, which are all seemingly describing things that we've been witnessing in recent months. So hopefully this is, uh, this is another sign and this is really is the time, God willing. Again, nobody is a prophet except Yoel and others, but we are not prophets, so nobody knows for sure. And, but we hope that this is it. And if enough people, you know, if we have like a collective consciousness of like, let's do it, let's bring it, right? That's what Yoel is really saying. He's saying, gather everybody together. The old people, the young people, the babies, the newlyweds, gather everybody together. And together, our collective consciousness is so powerful that if we believe it all together, we will bring it, right? It's in our hands. We know that. All the times and calculations, all is past. And our sages say it's all, it's all in our hands. We want the Geula, we have to bring it. So we have to bring that Mashiach consciousness, the Geula consciousness. If we all come together, we'll be able to, we'll succeed and we'll bring it. So may, may we succeed in this endeavor this year, God willing. Okay, we'll end with that.